Hello, and welcome back to The Crime Reel. For this week's true crime narration, we shall be looking at the lives of Carol Tregoff and Bernard Finch, and a story which played out through the tabloid media in the late 1950s and early 1960s. Carol was born in 1937 in South Pasadena, California. She graduated from Mark Keppel High School in Alhambra in 1955. She was a tall, beautiful young woman who completed a brief modelling course after high school but aspired to be an interior decorator. At the age of 18, she married her high school sweetheart, James Papa. James was three years older than Carol and was originally from Louisiana. However, his family relocated to California when he was young. James became a bodybuilder who would later go on to become a Mr. USA contestant. After their marriage, the couple bought a home in Big Dalton Avenue in La Puente, California. From the outside, this beautiful young couple seemed to have it all, but as we so often see, appearances can be very deceptive. Later in 1955, 18-year-old Carol began working at the West Covina Medical Center in Los Angeles. This was owned by a man named Bernard Finch. 38-year-old Bernard was an extremely successful and wealthy married doctor. Both Bernard and his wife of four years, 29-year-old Barbara, were keen tennis players and were frequently seen at the local country club or out socialising with their rich and famous friends. This was the second marriage for both Bernard and Barbara and they both had children from their previous marriages. Bernard had three children, Tom, Sharon and Linda, from his marriage to Francis Finch, and Barbara had a daughter named Patty from her marriage to Lyle Doherty. After Bernard and Barbara married in 1951, their ex-spouses started dating and went on to get married. Subsequently, Lyle then adopted Bernard's three children. Bernard and Barbara lived in a luxurious house on Lark Hill Drive together with her daughter Patty and their son Raymond, who was born in 1953. At his medical centre, Bernard had a reputation amongst the female staff of being a womaniser who had multiple affairs. In August 1956, after working for Bernard for around a year, Carol was promoted to become his medical secretary and, less than six months later, the pair had their first private lunch together. An affair soon followed and, within a couple of months, Bernard had rented an apartment in Monterey Park, which the couple visited every lunchtime in order to continue their affair. This went on for over a year before Barbara discovered her husband's infidelity in 1958. Barbara then called Carol's husband, James, who was shocked to learn that his wife was being unfaithful to him. When James confronted Carol, she told him that she wanted a divorce and moved out of their home and returned to live with her dad and stepmom. Meanwhile, Barbara decided to hire a private investigator to gather evidence of her husband's adultery. Under California law at the time, a divorce would entitle Barbara to half of Bernard's estimated $750,000 fortune. However, if she could prove adultery, the court could apportion any percentage to the aggrieved party that they deemed appropriate. Bernard was facing financial ruin. As the relationship between Bernard and Barbara became increasingly strained, Carol moved to Las Vegas, where she began working as a cocktail waitress whilst living in an apartment paid for by Bernard. On the 16th of May 1959, Barbara reported to the police that Bernard had pistol whipped her. When the police arrived, Bernard had already left the house and there was no further action taken. Bernard moved into a motel near his medical center. Four days later, on the 20th of May 1959, Bernard was served with divorce papers, citing his adultery and extreme cruelty as grounds for the divorce. A court order was issued freezing his financial assets. Bernard was livid. Barbara confided in their maid, 19-year-old Marie Anne Lidholm, that Bernard had threatened to kill her by putting her body in a car and pushing it over the cliff near their home, and if he couldn't do that, he would hire someone to kill her. Soon after these threats were made, 
Barbara set about getting a restraining order and visited a private detective to find out about hiring a bodyguard and also about how she should go about obtaining a concealed handgun license. It is reported that she told this detective that she probably wouldn't be alive by Christmas. On Friday the 17th of July 1959, Bernard took a late flight from California to Las Vegas to spend the weekend with Carol. The following day, Saturday the 18th of July, Barbara left her house at around 2.30pm to go to the Los Angeles Tennis Club. She arrived back home at around 11pm that evening, parking her car in the garage. Shortly afterwards, Barbara lay dead under a small tree on the edge of her property, having sustained two skull fractures and having been shot in the back just below her shoulder blade. The police were notified by Marie and arrived at the scene shortly after. Different stories as to what had happened that night began to emerge. Marie informed the police that she had been inside the house when she heard Barbara's car pull into the garage. A few minutes later, Marie heard arguing and Barbara shouting for help. Marie ran to the garage, switched on the light and saw Barbara lying on the garage floor, bleeding from a cut on her forehead. Bernard was standing over her. Marie then told the police how Bernard had rushed towards her, grabbed her by the face and banged her head into the garage wall. Marie was knocked almost unconscious by the blow, but could vaguely remember hearing Bernard telling her to get in the car. She dragged herself into the rear seat. Marie went on to state that Bernard had a gun in his hand and was forcing Barbara to get into the driver's seat of the car. However, Barbara jumped out of the car and ran out of the garage in the direction of Bernard's parents' house, who lived about 30 metres away. Marie used this opportunity to run back into the house and phone the police. As she was doing so, she heard a gunshot. The following morning, Bernard was arrested at Carol's Las Vegas apartment. After initially refusing to talk, he then insisted that he was in Las Vegas with Carol at the time of Barbara's murder. He stated that his car had been at the airport from the Friday evening as proof of his whereabouts. However, Carol told a different story. She claimed that she had moved to Las Vegas to get away from the love triangle and that Bernard had visited her on the Friday evening and he had suggested that they visit Barbara to sort out their divorce. Carol and Bernard drove from Las Vegas to Covina in her 1957 De Soto. She then parked along the road from Barbara's house. They walked up to Barbara's house and upon discovering that she was not at home, sat down on the front lawn to await her return. Carol then described how, when Barbara returned home and saw them, she screamed and pulled a gun out of her handbag. When Carol saw the gun, she ran and hid in the bushes and claims to have not seen or heard what had happened after that. When the police arrived, she crept away, returned to her car and drove back to her apartment in Las Vegas. When she arrived, Bernard was already there. Carol told the police that they had visited Barbara because Bernard was demanding a divorce which Barbara was refusing. However, the court records prove that Barbara had already initiated a divorce, so was Carol lying or had Bernard lied to her? Bernard later admitted to being at Barbara's house on the night of the murder with a version of events that replicated what Carol had said. Bernard claimed that after Barbara had pulled out the gun, Carol had indeed fled. A violent struggle between Barbara and Bernard followed and when Barbara had started to run away, Bernard said he chased her. He knocked the gun from her hand, but as he picked it up to throw it away, he claimed that the gun accidentally fired. Barbara continued to run away, but fell as she did so. Bernard caught up with Barbara and was amazed that she had been shot. He tried to leave her to phone for help, but Barbara asked him to stay with her. Her final words, according to Bernard, was to ask him to look after the children, both of whom were in the house at the time of the shooting, but thankfully did not wake up. Bernard went on to claim that in his distress he stole two cars, a Ford from nearby Citrus Avenue, which he then abandoned in La Puente before stealing a red and white Cadillac. He then drove back to Las Vegas to be with Carol. The Cadillac was found near Carol's apartment when Bernard was arrested the following morning. Carol testified at Bernard's preliminary hearing on the 29th of July. As soon as she left the witness stand, she was arrested. The police had suspected her involvement in the crime all along and discrepancies in her testimony confirmed this to them. 
Bernard and Carol stood trial together, starting in December 1959. The trial attracted excessive media attention, with details about the successful doctor and his beautiful mistress dominating news headlines. The press coverage was so intense that even when there was no new information to report, they ran stories about what Carol and Bernard would be eating for their Christmas dinner and how they would each be celebrating Christmas whilst in jail. The prosecution, who firmly believed Marie's version of events, also brought into evidence letters that Marie had sent home to her mother before the murder telling her of the violence and threats that Barbara had suffered at Bernard's hands. Additionally, the prosecution presented a witness by the name of John Patrick Cody, who testified that Bernard and Carol had hired him to seduce Barbara so that Bernard could counterclaim for adultery in the divorce. This was his plan to avoid financial ruin. This plan did not work, so Bernard and Carol paid John to kill Barbara. They made a down payment of $350 and several days later John told Carol that the job was done so she paid him the remainder of his fee, $850. In reality, John had spent the weekend partying and Barbara was still alive. When Bernard and Carol found out, John expressed surprise and stated that he must have killed the wrong woman. The couple agreed to pay a further $200 for John to complete the job, at which point he took the money and disappeared. John also testified that Bernard had said to him, before you kill her, tell her the bullet came from Bernie. The prosecution also presented evidence of what would become known in the press as a do-it-yourself murder kit. Bernard's brown leather briefcase was found at the scene of the crime and contained, amongst other things, bullets a carving knife, two 10-foot pieces of clothesline, sleeping pills, a stomach pump, a small bottle of unidentified liquid, hypodermic needles, surgical gloves and train schedules. The prosecution put forward the proposal that the couple had planned to ambush Barbara when she arrived home, knock her out with sedatives, then inject a fatal air bubble into her bloodstream before putting her behind the wheel of her car and pushing it over the cliff in order to make it look like her death was an accident. Bernard took the witness stand on the 3rd of February 1960. He stuck to the version of events which he had earlier described to the police. His defence team tried to show him as a frustrated but loving husband who had been driven into the arms of another woman after his wife lost interest in him following the birth of their son. Bernard admitted the details of his affair with Carol but claimed that his wife was also aware of it. He stated that they had agreed to date other people whilst postponing their divorce due to its financial implications until his deal to build his new hospital had been finalised. Bernard then claimed that Barbara had gone back on the deal after Carol's estranged husband James had told her details of Bernard's new life with Carol. At this point, Bernard admitted that he and Carol had hired John Cody to seduce Barbara, but nothing more and when they realised that John was ripping them off, they decided to visit Barbara to try to discuss things calmly with her. Bernard claimed that the so-called murder kit was simply rope for his boat, a knife for the apartment, and various items which he needed in his work as a doctor. After four months, the trial came to an end on the 13th of March 1960. The six men and six women of the jury spent over 40 hours deliberating this was over a period of eight days, but they could not reach an agreement. They voted 10 to 2 that Bernard was guilty of second degree murder and 8 to 4 that Carol was innocent. With no consensus reached, a retrial was necessary. Carol was released on $25,000 bail awaiting the second trial, whilst Bernard was denied bail. The new trial started a few months later on the 27th of June and ran until the 7th of November 1960. At the time, this made it the longest trial in California criminal history. All of the jury believed that Bernard was guilty of murder, but they as to whether this was first degree or second degree murder. The jury was also split 9 to 3 in favour of Carol being guilty. Once again, the trial ended in a hung jury and another trial was scheduled. 
The following year, starting on January 3, 1961, the third trial lasted until Monday the 27th of March when the jury returned their verdicts. They found Bernard guilty of first degree murder, Carol guilty of second degree murder and them both guilty of conspiracy to commit murder. The deputy district attorney stated that they would be seeking the death penalty for both defendants. On the 5th of April 1961, both Bernard and Carol were sentenced to life in prison. After hearing the verdict, Carol cried, No, 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 I'll be an old woman when I get out. With this sentence, they would both become eligible for parole after serving seven years, which is in stark contrast to the first ballot of the jury, which resulted in 11 to 1 in favour of the death penalty. Carol went to prison still declaring her love and dedication to Bernard and stating that they would marry once their sentences were complete. Seven years later, in 1968, both Carol, who was described as a model prisoner, and Bernard were denied parole. The following year, on the 1st of May 1969, Carol was granted parole and released from prison. She went into hiding at a friend's home and took a new name. Bernard was again denied parole, but this was granted two years later in 1971. He was released from prison on the 29th of October 1971, having served just over 10 years of his sentence. Carol remained living in the West Covina area, where she worked at a hospital until she retired. Bernard went on to marry a psychiatric social worker and practiced medicine in Missouri for several years before getting his California medical license reinstated. He died in 1995 at the age of 77. Despite declarations of their undying love, Bernard and Carol never met again after their release from prison. Thanks very much for listening to that story. Please leave your comments down below. I'd like to say thank you to Alonzo Calvillo for recommending and suggesting this case. Thanks very much for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye. Psst. There's a book called A Murder in West Covina that covers the case. It's written by James L. Jones. Goodbye.